Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session for maintenance organisations. We'll just leave it a couple of minutes or, or a minute at least to let a few more people in uh, to the session before we kick off. Right, good afternoon everyone and welcome to this session of our series of webinars on the end of the EU transition period. This one's for maintenance organisations. You can find the full list of our webinar series at our dedicated microsite, which is at info.caa.co.uk slash EU exit. Uh, my name is Will Nathan, I'm Head of External Relations here at the Civil Aviation Authority. And, uh, and today you'll be hearing from my colleagues Steve Horton and Mark Panton on the issues affecting maintenance organisations in a no deal scenario. There will be time for uh, at the end of this session for a QA, and a and we've allotted quite a lengthy period of time. So please do feel free to submit these questions throughout the session using the button at the bottom of your screen, as opposed to putting your hands up. There are obviously lots of people joining this session today, so it's unlikely we'll be able to get through all the questions, but we'll do our best. For those of you who uh, we don't get to the questions today, we can email you a follow up uh, after the session's complete. And finally, just so you're aware, we will be recording these sessions and making them available after to all approval holders. So you will receive an, another email to the same address to which we sent the invite to uh, with a recording of this webinar. Next slide, please. And just quickly to uh, cover off what the agenda for today's session is going to be, Steve is going to be covering the new regulatory framework uh, as of the 1st of January next year. And then Mark will be covering the continued validity of UK 145 approvals what do you, you as organizations have to do for to be prepared for the 1st of January 2021? What needs to be approved by the CAA? What are the other effects? What is practice three for EU EASA part 145 MOAs? And how about bilateral agreements and approvals following by that Q&A session I mentioned before? And with that, I'll hand over to Steve who'll run you through the new regulatory framework. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to take you through the, the regulatory framework um, that we'll, we've got in place at the moment and then how that moves across into 2021. Okay, next slide, please, Jim. Okay. Following the ratification of the withdrawal agreement at the beginning of the year, um, we formally left the EU on the 31st of January. At that point, we entered into a transition period, which takes us up to the 31st of December. Now, during this period that we're now in, all the uh, current EU agreements and the aviation key, the aviation regulation, continue to apply here in the UK. Now, you will be well aware that negotiations are ongoing at the moment for a UK EU agreement. And included in there is a long term aviation relationship um, negotiation that is also part of that bigger picture. But the UK will no longer be a participant in the EASA system after the transition period ends on the 31st of December. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, just to talk about the European Union Withdrawal Act. Now, the this uh, act actually brings the EU legislation into UK domestic law. 
it is only bringing across what is in force and in effect on the 31st of December. So that, that's the whole aviation of key will come across and it will be in UK law under the Withdrawal Act. Now, the, there are numerous um, secondary law instruments. You'll hear the term statutory instrument or SI. These have been made under the Act and these are necessary to make the legislation operable here in the UK. These SIs make no substantive requirements on the EU regulations. The EU regulations remain unchanged. And one important point here, there is no change to the identity of those regulations. So the regulation references that you know of today or see today will be those once we move into 2021. Next slide, please. So as we go into 2021, we're talking about future development of the UK safe aviation safety. At the end of the transition period, we will be responsible for the development of our own safety policy and regulation. We are in the process of establishing a capability to do this work, and we're working very closely with the DFT, and that will start from that process will be in place to start from 20, the early part of 2021. That provides us with the opportunity to improve how we develop our aviation safety policy in the future, and it will enable us to better involve industry in the decision making and develop the rules more flexible, flexibly. We will publish an annual program of change and it will derive from a prioritisation of the demands that exist at the time. We are currently developing the programme for 2021 and that will be published towards the end of this year. The changes for 2021 are likely to contain the completing the implementation of those EU regulations that are currently in train. And remember, at the start of this, I did say those rules that are in force and applicable at the time of the 31st of December come across. Those that are not applicable do not come across. So this is the piece here that we will complete those regulations coming across. Also, the implementation of ICAO SARPs and any deregulatory measures uh, for the General Aviation Unit. Okay, next slide, please. So now move on to Mark, who will go on to cover the uh, 145 approvals. Okay, Steve, thank you very much for that. Um, so as Steve's indicated, you know, the, the European legislation that we have at the moment uh, is being passed into UK law. Um, and, you know, what I'm going to run through over the next uh, series of slides is those subtle differences which may occur, uh, or will occur, should I say, um, as we go forward with this new legislation uh, that we have. That new legislation obviously is under the Withdrawal Act and the statutory instruments. Next slide, please. So we need to be very clear from the offset here is that obviously the negotiations are still going on. Um, so what we have done here is in this presentation is to give you the worst case scenario, um, you know, in terms of a preparation for a no agreement. Um, so until such times as the UK government and the European government or European Commission has finalised the uh, outcome of the negotiations, we would we don't know uh, exactly what happens in the future. So. This is very predicated on a no agreement scenario. Next slide, please. So on the, uh, the 31st of the 12th, 2020, uh, on the 1st of January, um, then we switch over to that new legislation. Uh, that new legislation is exactly what we operate under at the moment. So we have the same regulation references uh, and so forth. We have the same uh, parts, one for five, all the others. So your approval as it stands today will remain the same, nothing changes. We issued it as a CEA under part one for five today under the European system, and it will still be valid under the UK system on the 1st of January. So essentially the privileges of your organization will continue. 
your approval certificate will still remain valid, uh, which has all the terms of approval associated with that. You were able to carry out maintenance on uh, UK aircraft or engines or components for UK aircraft as you do today. What you can't do is um, be able to then work on EU aircraft or EU components or engines. That mutual recognition of a UK approval within the European system will cease on the 31st of the 12th, 2020. Uh, so the reality is, is that you will not be able to issue an EASA Form 1 or a CRS on an EASA aircraft from that day forward. Next slide, please. So what did we do on the 1st of January? Well, the, as I said, the, the most important thing is you cannot issue an EASA Form 1. You must change that document to be a CAA Form 1, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and that is really the main change uh, that you've got to be uh, cognizant of uh, with regards to making sure that you are still uh, approved and valid within the UK 145 uh, requirements. It is really important that if you've not started doing that work to implement this new change, then you should do so without delay uh, and making sure that your staff are aware of that change. Because even if an agreement is signed, because we've already, the government has already stated we will not be part of the EASA system, okay, we will not be able to issue an EASA Form 1 as an anticipated outcome of that agreement. So you will be using the CEA Form 1 from the 1st of January onwards. Next slide, please. So as you see here, it looks and feels very much like where we, we are used to today. Um, the CEA Form 1 is exactly the same as an, an EASA Form 1 with, with a few caveats. Obviously, the CEA Form 1, the name of the document at the top, and the template and the form number at the bottom, CA Form 1. But the essential elements of everything else remain the same. Um, so in terms of your certifying under Part 145, uh, you have authorised signatures, you have the approval date, your approval number, and so forth and so on. So all your other procedures around that remain the same. Next slide, please. So what do we need to do on the 1st of January to, to get you approved? Well, normally we would expect a template change, such as uh, you know changing the, uh, the, the Form 1 template. We would normally expect you to put an exposition change in uh, and get that approved. But because everybody is in the same situation and we don't want to be a bottleneck in terms of exposition changes, what we've decided to do is that you implement that change to CEA Form 1 from the 1st of January, and then at your next exposition amendment, whether it be a routine amendment or there's a change going on in your organisation, then include the CEA Form 1 template at that point. That way, the, we all uh, make it easier for ourselves um, to be able to manage the, the change under the CEA Form 1, um, and ensure that we don't end up with having an Im impact on the 1st of January. The certificates for the organisation, the approval certificates, they will be done over the next two years. So as you change your certificate or you change your uh, approval by adding another type or whatever, or adding different um, C ratings, we will change those certificates then. We will catch up with those who don't change anything in the next two years as we have to do a recommendation for you every two years and we will issue a new certificate around that period of time. So if you change nothing, you will get a new certificate in the end, but it will be done over the next two years. Next slide, please. So what are the other effects? What else is going to happen? Well, the key thing that you all need to do uh, is really look at the customers that you have. Um, and, you know, as I said at the beginning there, the, 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 the main impact is the fact that you will not be able to um, get recognition for a CA Form 1 as a release certificate for an engine or a component, or the, your ability to be able to issue a CRS for an EU aircraft after the uh, end of the year. If you are operating or you are gaining access to business within Europe, 
then you know you are strongly recommended to approach EASA uh, to e, uh, apply for a third country organisation approval, um, and many organisations already have done so in the UK, so that you can continue to supply your EU customers with an EASA Form One or issue a CRS for an EU aircraft. That's up to you, your uh, business needs, and uh, you need to determine whether that is necessary for you, but depending on your business model. In terms of uh, bilateral agreements, I'll go into a little bit of that more later on, but we have a dedicated webinar about bilaterals uh, next week. Uh, but in this situation, there is we have a number of bilaterals now where the acceptance of a CA Form 1 and or the CRS for an aircraft will be acceptable under those scenarios. Um, so those situations are unknown and they will be populated and provided the information to you quite soon. In terms of other parts of the world uh, where people may have accepted an EASA Form 1 or a CRS from an EASA organization uh, or an EU approved organization, there needs to be a conversation with your customer and with the local authority to see whether that can continue. Um, obviously, that's outside of our control. Uh, that is very much dependent on the local authorities and their discretion. Um, but we are here to support you with additional information should you require it. Um, so if that is the situation, please let us know. But we have already engaged with those, uh, with many authorities across the world to ensure that they understand where the U UK is changing and what the reality in terms of differences are, which is more administrative than substantial. Next slide, please. So the next two years, as we leave the transition period at the end of the year, and we move into the recognition period, which is uh, part of the statutory instrument that uh, Steve spoke about earlier on, we have a number of effects that then will help you uh, over the next two years. And when I say help you, if we didn't do this recognition period, what we would have is a more of a cliff edge scenario where immediately certain things would happen. So the, the UK government and the CEA have taken the decision to make certain um, uh, arrangements so that you as 145 organisations can continue to uh, accept data, um, understand what air wilderness directives you should use, acceptance of components, and what licensed engineers that you can use. Also, we have the situation of more for operators, but I'm going to give you the information here, is really about what we're doing in the opposite side, where people have used 145 organisations in Europe uh, and elsewhere, and what it means for them going forward. Next slide, please. So under that recognition period and that statutory instrument, uh, there is a situation where um, organisations need to be approved by, uh, before the 1st of January 2021 so that this uh, part of the legislation can actually be uh, used. But the, we recognise the fact that this could, contain, uh, could cause problems within uh, 145 organisations. So we elected to make a decision a policy decision to accept the uh, an EASA Form 1 from any EASA organisation approval where the UK is not the principal place of business. Now, why should we do that? That is to allow you to be able to continue to accept components for with an EASA Form 1 going forward so that we don't end up with the supply chain uh, stopping almost immediately. So that gives you the, uh, the ability to carry on accepting EASA Form 1s for, for a period of time. Now, the important factor here is this does not cover any organisation who gains an EASA third country approval that are based in the UK. So you cannot accept an EASA Form 1 for a UK-based EASA company. So if someone thinks that they, uh, they can uh, surrender their UK approval and just operate under an EASA approval and still supply into the UK, that cannot happen. Uh, that is not part of the arrangement. If you only work in Europe and you don't do any UK work, then uh, then that's fine. You can surrender your UK approval and carry on under an EASA approval. Uh, but certainly if you're supplying into the UK, 
and for everybody looking at acceptance of uh, components, we must ensure that that is managed appropriately. Next slide, please. So maintenance data, um, you know, we are very used to where we are at the moment. And what we have tried to do is to try and make that as simple as possible. So all data up to the end of the year will still be acceptable. It does not require any CA further approval. Any um, data approved via a UK approved DOA, a design organization, again, that will be acceptable in accordance with the privileges of that DOA. Any data which is approved under a bilateral agreement um, will be as per those bilateral agreements. And we need to ensure that you understand those bilateral agreements to understand the ramifications of what is acceptable and what is not. The thing what we can't guarantee right now, because those negotiations are still going on, is what is approved uh, via Europe. What we can say is if EASA is acting as a state of design for an aircraft or component or appliance, then that data will be acceptable. If they are have got design activity, uh, minor uh, amendments may well be acceptable. But as I said, all of that is still uh, awaiting the, the, ram uh, the ramifications of the final uh, negotiations. Next slide, please. So as I spoke about earlier on, the acceptance of components for a 145 is, is an, uh, an extremely important area. And so we've tried to make that as simple as possible for you. So CEA Form 1, new or used, again, acceptable, no restrictions. The EASA Form 1 will be recognized under the recognition period and will be allowable for the next two years, except for those UK-based EASA TCO approvals. The bilateral agreements, you use them at the moment. Um, and as I said, they will continue to be there for the, the three. There's more uh, bilateral agreements than we had before, and but they are subtly different in terms of their implementation, which actually means you, uh, for a 145 organization, it is potentially easier for you going forward uh, because the administrative burden has been removed. Next slide, please. So just showing you the uh, the details here in terms of we'll supply you with some flow charts just to sort of give you a better understanding of what you can and cannot accept um, and just to ensure that you know you implement these types of flow charts or this information into your procedures next slide please so that was new this is used most of it is exactly the same uh, however but you, there is some subtleties around this, but it's ensuring that you are aware of those subtleties uh, and we'll supply those, these uh, charts at the end of the webinar uh, so that you can actually see where those subtleties are. Next slide, please. So one of the most important things is obviously our, the certifying staff uh, for organisations. Now for C-rated organisations and B-rated organisations, uh, they are all competency based um, and that will continue as it does today. Um, for those in an A-rated organisation, you know, we use Part 66 licensed engineers today and you've got the ability to be able to use UK licensed engineers, EU licensed engineers, uh, if it's from another member state. Again, for UK licensed engineers, there's no restrictions. Uh, but for EU licensed engineers, there can be uh, some issues going forward over certainly the next two years, but potentially going forward further than that, where we've not been used to dealing with those circumstances uh, up to this point. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it depends where the facility is. Now, if we talk about um, facilities in the UK, EU licensed staff, will be able to continue certifying G-based aircraft under your uh, authorization system, as long as their license does not expire or change within the next two years. At the end of the two year period, or if their license expires or changes, they will need to apply for the UK Part 66 licenses. If their facility is within the European Union uh, member states, then again, the situation is that we can continue to use uh, European Union staff, Part 66 license staff, up into the point someone expires or changes a license or the end of the two year period. However, 
after that, or at the uh, after that, yes, um, the Part 145 Appendix 4 would be applicable, where the national licence of that uh, country would be applicable. For facilities outside of the UK and the EU, again, if you're using UK Part 66 licensed staff, that's fine, no problems. If it's EU licensed staff, again, they can continue unless their license expires or changes in the next two years or the two year period expires. This is where it becomes a little bit more problematic because obviously if it's outside of the EU and the UK um, and the person is EU licensed, then it's not the national license of the location of the facility. Then, uh, you know, so, so say for instance, it was in Hong Kong, then that EU license is not a Hong Kong license. Um, so the reality is then that EU license engineer would have to apply for a UK license. In this circumstances, as I said there, the national license of the country of the facility under Appendix 4 uh, of 145 would be applicable going forward. Next slide, please. For Air Wilderness Directives, actually, the reality is nothing has changed in terms of what we should apply. I think what has changed is our reliance on the EASA AD tool, uh, which then gives you all the information you might need. So just to ensure that we are actually fully aware of actually how we are supposed to look after ADs um, for you know, the, the, the aircraft or the components of the engines that we release. The first port of call will always be CAP 747. And we will be using that going forward to issue any ADs which are you know, varying a state of design AD from, an, from another um, uh, country or any ADs which we'll be using for products of the UK. You can continue to look at the EASA AD tool for anything up to and including the 31st of December 2020 for all aircraft types. That will all be our baseline on the 1st of January. So effectively all the ADs issued either by state of design, which is on, which has been adopted by EASA, or EASA have issued themselves, or varied state of design uh, AD, we will be carry on using them from the 1st of January onwards. But from the 1st of January onwards, or the 31st of December 2020, the primary air wilderness directives that we will be using is those from the state of design. So what do I mean by that? I mean, so if it was Boeing, it would be the FAA. If it was Airbus, it would be us. If it was Bombardier, it would be the Trans Transport Canada. So it's the state of design that the product part of the appliance uh, was designed and certified under. Next direct. Next slide, please. So in summary, you know, with, there is a few changes. A lot of your world will carry on in exactly the same way as it is today. We have to be careful about making sure that we change over to a CEA Form 1. We have to ensure that you've reviewed the circumstances of your business model and whether you need an EASA approval or not. You have to understand the differences between that CEA Form 1 and a UK issued CRS and, and the impact to your customers. Also, the fact around whether you can continue to accept the ASA Form 1s or equivalent, i.e. around bilateral agreements going forward and the impact to those acceptance processes and goods inwards and so forth. The use of Part 66 licensed engineers for the next two years has become a little bit more complicated. Uh, especially for those who are EU licensed uh, and so forth. And then it's design data and air wilderness directives um, and the subtleties around uh, you know, where we find that information, what information that we need to ensure is approved for the CEA. One thing I would turn around and say is that from a 145 perspective, because you're being instructed by a camel uh, then the responsibility for making sure that the maintenance and design data to release a component, an aircraft or an engine, is the responsibility of uh, the CAMO organisation, the Part MG organisation. So their responsibility is to make sure that they give you uh, or they indicate what data is acceptable in these circumstances uh, after the 1st of January. Next slide, please. 
So I'm just going to go on to now, just uh, for the EU and EASA organisations, just to give you an indication of what you might see in tech logs or paperwork and all the rest of it going forward. So if you go to the next slide. So what do I mean by practice three? Many organisations, I'm sure, who uh, have been using uh, organisations overseas and so forth, um, or have been involved in them, will understand this situation. A rulemaking activity was uh, done by EASA back in 2013, which talks about our, uh, aircraft, uh, uh, specifically aircraft, and those aircraft which are not covered by the basic regulation. What do I mean by that? I mean by aircraft covered who are state of registry not within the European Union. So as we go into the 1st of January, uh, we actually become one of those um, countries as well. We're no longer con uh, covered under the EU basic regulation. We will have our own basic regulation, uh, which is still the same number, uh, but it will be a UK version of that basic regulation. So the fact is, what we are going to do is take that situation of that rulemaking activity and use that to be able to uh, enable EU organisations, 145, or EASA organisations, which are EASA or, uh, look after all the organisations which are outside of the EU, and uh, enable those organisations to continue to release g registered aircraft or UK registered aircraft. Now, the circumstances that we will use is a commonly known uh, practice three uh, description, uh, which is effectively using the EASA approval number, but releasing the aircraft under UK uh, state of registry legislation. If we go to the next, uh, next slide, please. So, the bottom CRS statement, as it says, is the one we normally use. And that is going to be the same one that we use going forward after the 1st of January. Because as we said at the beginning here, everything that we have today has been brought over. But the circumstances is uh, EU and EASA may want to be specific around the, uh, the release of the aircraft and it not being under the EU basic regulation. And to give that clarity, the CRS statement uh, at the top there, so where we're actually releasing the aircraft under the National Aviation Law of the UK, would be acceptable also. So from a 145 perspective in the UK, this will not really affect you. Um, it, it really is uh, the, the camels need to ma manage this situation. But you may well see this in tech blogs or paperwork. Um, so you can see that there is two CRS statements uh, to be able to enable this practice to be, to be able to be used by an EU and EASA organization, a 145 organization. A similar situation will be used for part CAMEL, and uh, part CAMEL, part CEO, sorry, uh, and part MF, which is more for the, the GA type activity, but similar circumstances will exist for them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So what about bilateral agreements? So I don't go into the detail here. Uh, it's more to do with just giving you uh, a, an understanding of where we're going. If you go to the next slide, there's a dedicated webinar for um, bilateral agreements, which is going forward all next week uh, on the 18th, 19th. And that will give you far more detail than uh, what we have here. <clears throat> but the reality is, is that the bilateral agreements that you have today, the FA, Transport Canada, Brazil, they are still there. They will be there on the 1st of January. The, you will no longer use the EU bilateral. It will be a dedicated UK bilateral with whatever our bilateral partners are. We will have additional ones, uh, which we'll explain next week as well. Uh, and you know that, again, will give you more... Um, substantial uh, advantages in terms of being able to accept components from different locations or use different circumstances uh, which the uh, the bilateral agreements may give you in the future. Obviously everybody wants to know about the EU agreement and as I said at the very beginning we don't know until that agreement is finalized. Um, so uh, until such times as that's fully negotiated all we can say right now is that the current EU bilateral agreements will not be applicable to us from the 1st of January. 
and we ensure that we don't use uh, those agreements going forward. Even if you apply for a, a NIASA third country approval, then uh, is, uh, the current understanding is those bilateral agreements, those EU bilateral agreements, do not apply to uh, EASA third country approvals. So essentially, you will be able to do what you do today. Um, you'll be able to do that after the 1st of January. Uh, there may be more, and it may be slightly easier. Um, and you know, so the full details of that will be provided next week. Next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation. So if I hand back to Will, and uh, we can uh, look at the questions. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Steve. I hope everyone found that a, uh, a very useful session indeed. As I said at the beginning of this uh, session, we've got quite a lot of time allotted to this Q&A uh, now. Um, if we don't manage to make it through the full list of submitted questions, and bearing in mind there are a lot of you on this call and there are a lot of submitted questions already, uh, we will be able to email you directly if you don't submit your question anonymously uh, with the answer to your question. Uh, one of the questions that we've had quite a few of is, can we uh, get a copy of this webinar? As I said at the top of this call, we have recorded this session. We will be putting it on our YouTube uh, session, uh, our YouTube channel in more detail, and we'll be emailing it to all uh, all part 145 approval holders at some point in the coming days so you will have access uh, you will have access to this um, uh, information uh, in your inbox within the next couple of days right if we turn to the questions I'll be reading them out and then we'll be inviting Mark and Steve to respond uh, and we'll just go through it in the order in which they've come in so the first one is which NAA will be responsible for oversight of UK under e under YASA TC145? Okay, I'll answer that one. So the reality is, is the the uh, situation will be is that um, EASA will manage their approval. Uh, we will have no involvement of that approval, uh, and it's not related to your CA approval. So it will be it will be completely separate and um, different, and EASA will manage the oversight appropriately according to their rules. Great, thank, thanks, Mark. And I think we'll stick with you. Does the CAA have a list of MROs that will obtain CAA 145 on the 1st of January 2021? Yes, we do. Um, and they will all be published uh, in the public domain on the 1st of January. All UK approved organisations are actually published on our um, uh, website, including all the ratings they have and so forth. That's already there. So as these organisations are approved on the 1st of January, they will then pop up on the, EASA, on the um, UK CEA website. And will any alternative means of compliance granted by the CAA prior to the end of the transition period be accepted by EASA? And do the CAA have a list of these uh, alternative means of compliance, including those issued by all the EASA NAAs? Steve, I think that's yours. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is uh, alternate AMC issued prior to us um, moving across into next year. Um, that is going to have to be a question for those that on the ASTA side that issue the approval. Um, we've accepted that um, alternate means. Um, whether they do or not, I cannot answer that. I, my assumption would be and hope would be that they do, but I cannot give a definitive answer on that. Great, thanks, Steve. And per guidance uh, provided by the CAA, non-UK EASA MROs are permitted to use their EASA approval to certify uh, aircraft under, or UK aircraft under UK legislation for up to two years after the 1st of January 2021. Does this cover line and, basement, uh, and base maintenance? How would a base maintenance CRS be issued using this privilege? So the circumstances are around the the ability for a practice three to be issued is not restricted to whether it's line maintenance or space maintenance. They can be used in either case. Um, and effectively, it's the, the CRS that you issue, whether it be in the tech log, whether it be in a work pack or a separate piece of paper, um, that will have the relevant CRS statement on. And then you will use the EASA approval number to be able to certify that CRS. So you know, it isn't really fundamentally different to what we do today. 
the the way we do it in terms of enacting it is slightly different, but fundamentally it just allows the asset organisations to carry on certifying uh, uh, UK registered aircraft. However, what I would say is that the the plan going forward is to ensure that rather than us having a, a cliff edge in two years time where everybody needs a UK approval, we the UK CEO will be inviting people. Uh, different parts of industry to gain a UK approval at an earlier stage so that then we can then plan the end of the recognition period. So initially base maintenance, then line maintenance or engine maintenance, and then, um, and then component maintenance at a later stage. Now obviously that is dependent on agreements and or bilaterals that may be arranged over the next two years. Um, so it, you know we won't be doing anything initially in the next couple of months, you know, in the, in the first few months, but that is the plan going forward. Great, thanks, Mark. I think this next one's for Steve. Does the CAA intend to continue accepting EASA releases after two years, after the two-year period? The, um, the two-year period gives us the opportunity to decide what we want to do um, at the end of that period. Uh, there's no firm decision. Um, there's no overarching view on this at the moment, but we will start to make um, looking into it uh, fairly soon as we get into 2021 um, in case we need to make regulatory changes. But as I said, there's no firm decision which way we're going to go yet. Thanks, Steve. Um, can a UK based MRO issue an EASA Form 1 using its EASA TC145 approval to remove components off a G registered aircraft? The simple answer is no, because the G registered aircraft is a third country um, aircraft and therefore is not part of the EASA system. So if you look at part 145 uh, A50 AMC2, that aircraft would then become under paragraph 2.8. So um, the, the reality is, is any component coming off of a g reg aircraft to go into the European system would not be um, acceptable to put a NASA Form 1 on it unless it went through a workshop. Great, thanks, Mark. I think the next one's back to Steve. How many states has the UKCA approached to agree bilaterals for Article 145 maintenance? As it is today, we've been talking with... with as already mentioned, we've got the US, Canada, and Brazil, um, and we're currently in negotiation with Singapore. Um, and there's a slightly different agreement with Japan. So those are the ones that are in play at the moment. Um, going forward, um, we, the, the priority at the moment is the UK EU one. Uh, once that is resolved and in place, then we'll be looking at um, which ones do we go on from there. But that will be driven um, probably more from the DFT rather than the CAA. But um, as yet, we haven't yet got a got a definitive list and we haven't got a definitive order for any countries. Thanks, Steve. I think the next one's probably for Mark. If no bilateral agreement is, ag is agreed with the EU, could engineers hold both a UK license and an EASA license? So most bilateral agreements don't include licensing. Um, so the reality is on the 1st of January, uh, you will be able to hold a UK license and an EASA license. So for those who have transferred out from the UK to EASA, to a, a European Union um, NAA, uh, they can then reapply for the UK approval, a uh, UK license back, um, and then hold both of those licenses. If someone needs a license has expired in the European Union and they renew it, as I said to you before, that that can no longer be used in the UK to be uh, certifying G-Reg aircraft, then they can apply for a UK license and hold both licenses at the same time. And sticking with you, Mark, how are current regulations at MPA, et cetera, going to be managed? So it's a bit of between me and Steve, this one, because the current regulations uh, are, you know, being passed over into the Withdrawal Act and the statutory instruments, as we said. And then uh, we will have a rulemaking process. We'll then update those, um, those uh, regulations as and when 
IKO SARTS uh, change or the UKCA and DFT uh, need to change something because of what are, whatever circumstances. So that will be a published agenda on how we manage that going forward uh, and everybody will get to know about that. Is there a CAA Form 1 template we can access now to use to modify our own documents? Yes, there is. It's on the uh, the CEA Brexit microsite, and uh, we can certainly make sure that we point to that again after the uh, webinar. Info.caa.co.uk slash EU exit, if any of you are unsure. <laughs> um, right, next one. Will the EASA Foreign Part 145 option be available to UK approved organisations? Uh, so you cannot use Practice 3, if that's the question, in the UK. So practice three is only to be used where the principal place of business for the organization is outside of the UK and also the aircraft itself is outside of the UK. So if it's inside the UK, it must be certified by a UK approved uh, organization. Steve, I think this one's for you. Has there been any discussion around dual release between CAA and DIASA? The well, okay. At the moment, the negotiations are, are in play, um, and that is at the uh, government level. It hasn't yet come down to the authority level, so um, until we reach that point, we won't know. So I'm afraid, again, no definitive answer. Uh, Steve, we'll stick with you. With will the CAA form one be the same for new manufacturers and repairs? So the, the Form 1, the CIA Form 1, is across all organisations so um, and all approvals. So whatever um, you need to issue a Form 1 for, then it's the CIA Form 1. Great, thank you. Um, is there any agreement with the Isle of Man and Guernsey authorities for the acceptance of a UK Part 145 release for aircraft after the end of the transition period? So... I think we've spoken to all the different authorities, as many as we possibly can, uh, and it is actually down to them on whether they accept a Part 145 release uh, from a UK approved organisation or not. So, uh, you know, you need to contact those authorities to, to verify what arrangements they have put in place for this change. Thanks, Mark. And does the restriction to not issue any ASA Form 1 relate to both UK registered aircraft and aircraft registered in another EU state? So the restriction here is really not to issue any ASA Form 1. Is If you've got a UK approval, so a UK.145. You cannot issue any ASA Form 1 from the 1st of January onwards. If you have an EASA third country approval, then you can use an EASA Form 1 under that approval. So it's not about the aircraft per se, it's more to do with what type of approval you can, uh, which type of approval you have, and then what's the, what is the applicable uh, uh, release tag that you're going to use. For aircraft themselves, for the UK, as I said earlier on, we've enabled the situation of carrying on to accept EASA Form 1s as a, an acceptable release tag for components to be fitted to an aircraft registered in the UK. Um, so that's the plan, but a CEA Form 1 is not at the moment, as we, as we stand at the moment, uh, allowed on any new aircraft. Um, and I think this one's for Steve. If we as an organisation applied to EASA as a third country in case of a no deal last year, the assumption, our assumption is that this is still acceptable and then we can continue releasing EASA Form 1s from the end of the transition period. Yeah, the understanding is that the, those, those um, applications that have been made still stand. Um, I believe EASA are holding them back at the moment because of the negotiations are ongoing. But if a, an approval is given and you have a hold a third country approval issued by EASA, then yes, you'll be able to issue an, an EASA Form 1. And can UK registered aircraft still use FAA or EASA 8130 forms for component approvals and EASA or FAA STC for installation approval? The, the situation there is, yes, uh, you will still be able to then gain, uh, use components from the, uh, under the back FAA uh, bilateral agreement with the UK, or I say the US-UK bilateral agreement, 
Uh, so there is uh, um, circumstances within that agreement to be able to carry on accepting components from um, those particular uh, organisations. The details will be given to you next week because there is some slight changes around acceptance and what forms we'll use and so forth. Uh, and so that's important that you, know, that you join that by a webinar next week. But in terms of EASA and FA SDCs, if the SDC was approved prior to the 31st of January, if, sorry, 31st of December uh, in EASA, then it would still be applicable. If it's after that, then uh, you need to contact the CEA, uh, depending on you know the circumstances uh, that has been agreed in the agreement that has been negotiated at the moment. FAA SDCs, again, will be in the uh, bilateral agreement details. So uh, that you need to look at the bilateral to confirm what the approval status is and whether you need further UKCA approval. I think this next question is probably a question for Yasa, but perhaps um, Mark or Steve, you can you can yeah. try and answer it. Is there a closing date for UK organisations to apply for Yasa Part One Four Five One Four Five approvals, and what is that closing date? So, as, as far as I'm aware, uh, all the details are listed on the IASA website uh, under Brexit, uh, as far as I'm aware, including all those who have applied already. Um, I am not aware, but I cannot confirm, uh, that there is a closing date, but I would suggest the closing date to uh, get the simplified version would be the end of the year. After that, it, it's up to IASA to decide how they're going to go forward. And Mark, will the exposition remain applicable to the CAA and DRSA? So currently the, the, the situation is the exposition is written for the UK CAA approval uh, and that will be the same exposition going forward. What EASA decides to do is up to themselves. So a third country approval um, has a, usually uh, has to comply to the user guide uh, and all the details in the user guide. Uh, now, how that changes what a UK CEA uh, exposition um, is, is dependent on EASA's interpretation of what needs to happen. But certainly, in the moment, um, the, the exposition will be applicable to the CEA approval, and then EASA need to decide what they're going to do. That may mean a supplement, or it may mean a full new exposition. Give you a break, Mark, and give this one to Steve. Um, will UK registered, we've already answered this one, I think, but um, just to reiterate the point, will UK registered aircraft be able to accept EASA Form 1s post January 2021, or will they only accept UK CAA Form 1s? Okay, for G registered aircraft post 1st of January 2021, we will continue to accept the EASA Form 1. Um, and we that will continue for up to two years. And during that two year period, we'll make we'll look at what we're doing post that period but from the 1st of January we will continue to accept the, the EASA Form 1. As long as the principal place of business is not in the UK for the organisation. Yeah with that caveat. <laughs> Great thank you. There's a question here about whether the bilaterals uh, are going to be published on the website and if so where. Um, I know we obviously have our two sessions next week specifically on bilaterals, but have either of you got an answer to that question? Yeah. So some of the information is already on there, um, uh, existing on the CAA website under, I think it's Air Wilderness and Bilaterals, uh, and there's a page dedicated to there. Uh, my understanding is that the, the, the full bilateral text will be published in the next, so I'd say, week, week or so, uh, as they're agreed and signed, um, they will be published on the CEA website. Great, thanks Mark. Um, will EASA Form 1's issued by a UK Part 145 organisation before the 1st of January, so before the end of the transition period, be acceptable to UK 145 organisations and EASA 145 organisations after the 31st of December? The so that is quite good. I was going to say that the, the, any EASA Form 1 issued by a UK organisation pre the 31st of uh, December, yes, that's still acceptable for a UK aircraft. Um, how or what the uh, uh, EASA decide to accept, um, we, we will have to wait and see what they decide on and what they publish. 
And is the acceptance of a CAA Form 1, a UK Form 1, likely to be accepted by EASA in the event of a CAA EASA bilateral, as is mooted? I would suggest that we can't comment on that until such times as the uh, negotiations have been concluded, because we, uh, you know, until we actually know the, fu uh, the the fundamentals of what's been agreed, uh, then we, you know, it would be inappropriate to give a, a you know a comment on that at the moment. I'm sticking with Form Ones on the raising of a CAA Form One. Is this to include a bilateral statement in Block Twelve? Uh, yes. So where you end up with a dual release. Um, CA Form 1 uh, under a bilateral agreement, then that would be the situation. Um, but um, the, the circumstances may be subtly changing around the release of certificates for those bilaterals. So uh, the full details will be given next week. And the acceptance of an EASA Form 1, is this for new items or repaired items? Both. Nice and speedy. Um, can a UK-based Part 145 organisation hold both a UK and EASA Part 145 approval and release the appropriate Form 1 based on the customer aircraft registration, so UK or EU, post January 2021? Yes, yeah, that's perfectly acceptable. I mean, you, could, you can release a component with two certificates on it, one EASA Form 1 and the UK form, uh, CEA Form 1, if you have both approvals. Um, so that's perfectly acceptable. Great, thank you. As the rule structure is the same for existing and future EASA 145 approval holders, will the CAA accept this approval standards and processes for the grant of the UK equivalent approval without additional investigation beyond the recognition period? Steve, I think this comes back to your point about what the two year recognition period allows us to do. Yeah, the, at the moment, the, the, the recognition period um, is, is recognising the EASA approval, um, the approval and uh, going forward for just up to the two year point. Um, as already mentioned, we're going into our own policy and rulemaking process. So there is the potential for the, the UK regulations uh, to um, diverge from the EASA regulations. So um, two years time, um, I can't answer whether or not we would accept uh, one approval as the basis for issuing another approval, but um, I would suggest at the moment, don't assume that we will. And I think it's important to say there that, you know, early applications in this current circumstances where we, the UKC is allowed to third country approvals from the EU and, and elsewhere in the world, we already have a process for that and a simplified process. So, um, so early applications is probably an easier situation in those circumstances. Right, we've got a few questions now on part 66, Mark. As the licensing standards are the same, will the UK grant a UK equivalent license based, on a, based upon a valid EASA license? So the rule set is the same. So we have no uh, ability to be able to uh, give a UK license uh, because someone else has got another type of license. So it doesn't matter whether it's EASA or the rest of it. So the process that is going to be put in place is, is effectively um, to gain the relevant records. Um, once we've got those records, then we can issue the UK license. So it is a simplified process. It's like a state transfer situation. Uh, but obviously, because we're on the, uh, we're not part of the EASA system, state transfer actually can't happen. So, um, but we have a process which is hopefully similar and acceptable to most people um, so that we can in minimize the, uh, the, the amount of work an applicant has to do and we can then uh, issue a UK license as quickly as possible when an EU license holder applies. And could you clarify if a UK MOI, MOA facility in the UK can be can use EU excuse the dog barking in the background can use EU Part sixty six staff if their license is amended to for example including a new type rating or a new category. So as far as I'm aware at the moment that if someone's license expires or is amended changed then their license uh, no longer is acceptable within the uh, under the recognition period. The reason for that is because that license will be issued by an EASA authority. 
So it's no longer uh, comes under the recognition period of two years. So therefore, they'll have to apply for a UK licence at that point if they wish to carry on certifying UK aircraft. Is that right, Steve? Yep, that's correct. Yeah. And will the issue of a UK Part 66 licence be a simple process to convert the current EASA privileges to a UK licence, or are there likely to be additional requirements? No, it's going to be a very simple process. As I said, it's all about the records. Um, so if we got the records, then we can issue the UK licence uh, very quickly. So um, there isn't, a, there, there will not be a tremendous burden on the applicant to be able to get this license. Great, thank you. Moving on slightly, our organisation has applied for EASA third country approval. We have FAR 145 approval pending. After the 31st of December, how do we issue dual release certificates for work carried out? Will it be a CAA Form 1 with dual FAA release plus an EASA Form 1? So in that circumstance, once your uh, FAR um, 145 approval has been given um, and we, we go over to the 1st of January, um, then at that point, if you issue a, uh, a component, if you release a component on the 1st of January, you'll issue a CAA Form 1 dual release with the FAA. And then if you've got an EASA third country approval, you'll do a separate certificate with an EASA Form 1. Parts already receipted into stores under EAS and EASA Form 1, but not yet fitted. Are they still affected under the two-year period for allowance for use, or does the two years apply to data fitting? So the basic situation here is an EASA Form 1 issued prior to the 31st of December is acceptable forever. Um, it's, it's, it's anything after that that is the problem. Uh, and that's where we've recognised that EASA Form 1. So we, we, we need to understand, you know, in terms of that EASA Form 1, when it was issued, and then, then it would be a situation if it was issued after the 1st of um, January, then it, it would only be a situation for two years. Great, thanks. We still have lots of questions coming in. I'm not sure we'll manage to get through them all, but we'll do our best. Can we automatically raise a CAA UK EASA Form 1 for units we hold in AOG stock currently held around the world within EASA Form 1 without needing to recertify the part? So if, you're, if your part already has an EASA Form 1, you know, it will be acceptable in the UK. Um, so there's no need to recertify any part with an EASA Form 1 issue prior to the 31st of December. Uh, with a CEA form one, they're still acceptable. Um, so it's those those ones that are issued um, with certification after the 1st of January that we're concerned about. Thanks, Mark. I'll try and give this one to Steve, just to give you a bit of a rest. Will the current Part 66 licences be reissued after the 1st of January 2021? So all licences issued by the UK um, to UK engineers, um, it's a it's a license issued under the EASA regulation by us as the national authority. So there's still valid licenses. Now the there is a five year life on those, and they will be as they come through the the process, they will be issued with a UK badged license. So it's it's um, there's no need uh, at, uh, to um, change those out uh, until we actually have to do that so the current uh, eu badged part 66 license is still valid it was issued by us as the national authority so that's okay if a uk-based mro issues an easa form one for a component using their easa tco 145 approval why can't this component be fitted on a UK registered aircraft for two years like any other EASA released component? Surely this provides an advantage to EU MROs. What's the safety case for this? So the fundamentals here is we're looking at for you know the, the situation of ensuring that where the aircraft in the UK are fitted with the uh, UK approved components and, you, and are certified by UK uh, organisations. So it, it, we are not allowing that situation of using a third country approval within the UK because, and the part of the reason, the rationale for that is because 
we have to be able to demonstrate um, our um, compliance to the ICAO SARPs and the Chicago Convention. So if, if everybody was using a third country approval in the UK to release aircraft, we would not be demonstrating that in an effective way. So that's why you know, the, the, the UK approvals are paramount within the, the borders of the UK uh, in the same way as every other country does. And third country approvals are only to support uh, the aircraft when they are outside of the jurisdiction of the UK borders. And if a UK MO obtains TCL approval to issue CRS on EU registered aircraft, is it expected, can a UK Part 66 license holder certify the release of EU aircraft under the auspices of the TCO approval? You can, as long as the Appendix 4 uh, to Part 145, which allows the national license of the facility that the organisation is operating at, um, is, you know, so in the situation of a UK facility, it would be a UK Part 76 license, because that's our national license. So uh, you would have to then demonstrate compliance to Appendix 4 of 145. And how will this affect those MROs in the US that have any ARSA supplement? Will they need to submit a new supplement through the FAA to the CAA? So those situations now, I mean, they, they, unless they apply for a CEA uh, approval, then nothing changes for them. They'll still have it in the ass of the supplement as it has at the moment. So, um, you know, as we progress over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, then organisations will uh, apply for the CEA approval under the bilateral in the US. But at the moment, the circumstances is, as far as I'm aware, is the EASA supplement and the EASA approval uh, will will remain because it's under the EU US bilateral, and then and then the the dual release eighty three eighty three ten will then be acceptable in the UK. And Steve, is this one for you? Is the wording of the CRS statement going to change after the first of January twenty twenty one? No, if you're referring to what Mark put up on the practice three, no, that is the uh, CAA's. CRS statement from part 145 as we go forward uh, next year. Great, thank you. There's a technical agreement in place with JCAB, which comes into effect on the 1st of January 2021 for OEM. Is there an agreement in work to cover maintenance? Uh, uh, sorry, Mark. I'll, I'll, I'll try and take that one. The, the, no, the... Um, uh, the agreement we have in, with the Japanese at the moment is um, purely around um, production, um, although we are uh, considering looking at it uh, uh, in a wider scenario um, as we go forward. Great. Thank you, Steve. Are there any requirements for component maintenance organisations certified staff? It's the same as today, um, so it's competency based, um, and uh, you know, so it's it's around you know the training required to be able to competent in those components that the organisation is looking after, and to demonstrate that they are competent um, in those circumstances. So there is no difference in terms of what we do today will be the, the, the same uh, on the first of January for component and engine maintenance. And, and uh, so just to clarify a previous point, do we have to change our 145 CRS from the 1st of January 2021? No, you don't. So the, the CRS statement, as it stands today, is exactly the same as it is on the 1st of January. The only one it has a subtle change is if you are operating under a, an EU EASA um, approval and you're releasing a GWES aircraft under practice three. And that's only if the local authority wants to make it very clear that they're not releasing the aircraft under the EU basic regulation. So the reality is one CRS statement today is exactly the same statement um, on the 1st of January, and that's the normal one that we use today. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, 
if a UK-based EASA Part 145, which automatically becomes a UK Part 145 on the 1st of January 2021, has a TCL approval from EASA, will they be able to issue an EASA UK dual certificate from what, for Form 1? And if so, would this then be acceptable to be fitted to a UK registered aircraft? So you don't have an EASA Part 145 approval today. You've got a UK Part 145 approval uh, issued under EU legislation. So on the 1st of January, you'll have the same UK Part 145 um, uh, approval, which is then enacted via the Withdrawal Agreement, uh, the Withdrawal Act. So in the circumstances you describe here, there will be, unless the negotiation and the trade agreement uh, comes up with something, uh, there will be no EASA UK dual release certificate. It will be a, a UK CA Form 1 for the UK approval and EASA C, uh, Form 1 for the EASA TCO approval. And therefore, to fit that to the aircraft, if you are based in the UK, then you can only use the CEA Form 1 to be able to fit to that UK registered aircraft. If your principal place of business was outside of the UK, then you could use an EASA Form 1 or a CEA Form 1. Great, thanks, Mark. Another question about dual release of an engine. If the customer requests an EASA Form 1 dual release, do we, excuse me, do we issue the CAA UK Form 1 dual release? No, there's no such thing as a dual release at the moment for, with a CAA Form 1. There will be dual releases for uh, other bilateral agreements, but as I said, until such times we get the, uh, the details of the EU-UK trade agreements, uh, Currently, as we said at the beginning of this presentation, that we're looking at a non-agreement scenario, uh, so that you've got the worst case scenario. So there is no dual release um, CA Form 1 in the ASA at the moment. So, uh, you know, it would be two separate certificates if you have the applicable approvals. And can I receive formal notification of my CAA Part 145 approval number? It's the same as you have today. Easy. Um, please confirm validity of practice three, which I think we've already done. So I'll move on. Can we get the CA? Um, can we get the CAA list earlier than the first of January? I believe this is referring to TCO. Um, EASA already have done their list. Um, unfortunately, the way the system works, you know, it, it doesn't get published in that way. So um, I will take that question away uh, and see whether we can uh, issue a pending list. Um, so I'll talk to policy about that. Thanks, Mark. Um, aircraft that are currently classified as EASA aircraft, what will they be classified as post 31 December 2020? Part 21 aircraft. And having obtained third country approval and still requiring CAA approval, will I need, will, will I need a separate MOE for each approval? I would suggest your, your MOE, uh, as it stands at the moment, is, is UK centric uh, and the CEA centric. Uh, so therefore, uh, any third country approval that goes over the top of that, well, you would have to talk to the, the, the applicable authority, whether it be ASA or whoever, and whether they're going to accept a supplement or a uh, full MOE. Great. Um, Mark, if it's all right with you, what I suggest is that we keep answering questions until half, half past one. And after that, will any remaining questions will email to the participants directly. Are you happy with that? Yep, that's fine with me. Great. Uh, for organisations that have complete uh, have multiple components in stock with the ASA Form 1s that may not be used within the two-year period, our process moving forward would be to inspect the components on the shelf and issue a CAA Form 1 to minimise sending these items back out for recertification by a C-rated organisation. Is this acceptable? So if you've got components on the shelf with uh, an EASA Form 1, there is no need to recertify those components. Those components are perfectly acceptable with the documentation that they have on them right now. Uh, and they will be acceptable over that period of time. Um, so even after that two year period, um, then you know the, the anything issued prior to the 31st of December 2020 is still going to be acceptable because they were issued before we withdrew this from the system. So, it, you know, it is very much dependent on when the certification was made, on whether it needs to be recertified or not after the two year period. 
Great. And how does the the new UK Part 145 approval affect current aircraft on the G-Reg operating under state conditions? Will we still need to have B-Car approval? <laughs> right, this is, this is a good one because the reality is as it stands at the moment. So if you are operating state aircraft, then you still maintain them under a B-Car approval. Now, as we go forward, and Steve can um, speak a bit more about this, then we will look to see uh, of how we combine the two systems. Uh, but that's not an initial thing that we're looking at. Steve, do you want to carry on? Yeah, the, only, yeah, the thing I would just add there, once we get past the end of this year, um, we have far more flexibility in the rulemaking and it would ap make absolute sense to have just one set of rules uh, for all uh, aircraft on an ICAO compliance C of A. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. And drawing kit from goods in the MRO, please confirm we can continue to issue parts into MRO with EF1, uh, uh, with in the ASA Form 1 until the end of the recognition period. So just to be clear here, right, okay, so if you've got parts incoming with an EASA Form 1, you will be able to continue to use those EASA Form 1 uh, certified components for up to the end of the two year period. Um, if those parts are certified after the 1st of January. So it's important to understand that, you know, you, you can use EASA Form 1 uh, certified components um, going forward. So there's no cliff edge at the end of the, the, the end of this year. And will a separate MOE be required for the TC145 approval, i.e. will our current EASA MOE continue and be audited and regulated by, by EASA moving forward and we submit a new MOE with UK Part 145 changes to the UK CAA? Okay, so to be clear, you do not have an EASA MOE. You have a UK approved Part 145 MOE and therefore any other approval that you apply for over the top of that will have to be discussed with that authority uh, so that they tell you what, whether uh, a UK MOE is acceptable with the supplement or a full MOE will be required by them. So it's not something that we can actually confirm or deny. And from the 1st of January 2021, relating to AOG activities away from base, a UK MRO supporting a UK registered aircraft in Europe, a CAA CRS applies, and equally, if EU registered, did then TCO CRS approval, applies is that correct yes that's correct wonderful under the use of practice three you mentioned that a new crs statement would uh, need to be used for easa approved mros would not these organizations be non-compliant within um, the easa part 145 requirements with regards to issuing a crs as the statement will be different should they be issuing the crs with two statements no, because the circumstances is, and this is explained in the EASA Foreign 145 user guide, if someone, if you go into the EASA website, is that you are not certifying the aircraft under the EASA system. You're certifying the aircraft under the, U, in our case, the UK system. So the CRS statement, which it, um, the practice three document will be published before the end of the year so that you so that EU and EAS organizations have the full information but you've seen what the, the two CRS statements are and it is the, the more expanded one it talks about national aviation law of the UK is really only necessary if the local authority are not happy about using a CRS statement which is similar to the EU one so that's, it's only a, 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 you can use either one. Uh, our one is the same as the European one, because as we said, the law comes over, it's exactly the same. And that other one just makes it very clear that the, the aircraft has been released under UK law, not EAXA law or EU law. With an, MOA, with an MOA that has approved sites overseas, for instance, um, Asia, and certifying both G-registered aircraft and EU-registered aircraft, can there be any mutual acceptance between EASA and the CAA of audits conducted by either NAA? No, not at the moment. And how can a request for triple release ARC be met for the EU customers by a company holding third country approval? 
So you cannot use a triple release airworthiness, eh, not airworthiness, um, uh, release tag or release certificate um, with the EU. It has to be a separate. If you've got a third country approval, it's a separate EASA uh, form one. Um, maybe this is one for Steve. Steve, assuming we are shadowing EASA 145 rules for now, will the UK CAA feel comfortable to issue their own alternative means of compliance over the next two years for a UK 145 line maintenance organisation, irrespective of where EASA want to take their regulations and alt mocks? Okay, first first point, we're not shadowing the, the ERC 145 as we go forward. Um, as of the 1st of January, we'll, we'll have our own uh, decision-making process. The AMC and GM are being brought across on the 31st of um, uh, December, so that matches the rules and the regulations at that point. Going forward, the um, AMC and GM will go through a very similar policy rulemaking process that I described earlier, um, but it won't go through for um, to the DFT for um, it going as a rule change. So we will still be following our own process of changing AMC and GM. As said, we have more flexibility because we're on our own. So we will make our own decisions as we go forward, but each decision to change will have to be justified and go through a due process. Does the location of the aircraft have an effect on the requirement for where a CAA Form 1 can be issued? Uh, for instance, a UK registered aircraft located in an EU country or an EU registered aircraft located in the UK? So the CAA Form 1 Okay, regardless where the aircraft is, can be fitted to a UK aircraft. A CAA Form 1 cannot be fitted to an EU registered aircraft, regardless whether it's in the EU or the UK. Staying with you, Mark, with regards to EU Part 66 licensed staff, this participant understands that they can continue to certify UK registered aircraft until their license expires or changes. But can you clarify that that change would include an additional an addition of type rating? Yes, it will do. So any change which includes a, uh, an additional category or an additional uh, type rating effectively changes the license, and therefore uh, a new license is issued by that authority. And therefore, that license no longer is covered under the recognition period. So uh, a UK license will have to be applied for. And this um, this particular participants organization currently releases triple release EASA Form 1, FAA and TCCA. Uh, they have received EASA TCL approval. From the beginning of January, they intend to issue EASA Form 1 single release and CAA Form 1 triple release. Will this be acceptable? So in terms of that circumstance with it described there, it would be correct if it wasn't for the change with one of our bilaterals. So um, where we've moved the bilateral into mutual acceptance. So uh, the CA form one actually will only have a uh, dual release because one of the bilaterals will actually be a mutual acceptance of a CA form one and the applicable um, release tag from the other country. I don't think this is a straightforward one, Mark. Um, you have spoken in detail about Part 66 engineering licenses. How does the CIA intend to classify NDT certification approvals for use on both UK and EU based aircraft? And will EN 4179 be the certification standard ma mandated by EASA, uh, be the mandatory standard adopted by the UK CAA, or will an acceptable alternative means of compliance such as ISO 9172 or NDT certification be open for discussion. So this is quite clear. Okay, uh, remember what I said. We said at the beginning is that the regulation is pulled over. One four five is pulled over into uh, UK law, including uh, we then we bring over the AMC and the GM uh, as a decision from the CA. So EN four one seven nine will be used in the UK along with GR twenty four. I think it is. Uh, which discuss, discusses NDT certification and so forth. Um, so all of the same requirements for NDT will be the same uh, on the 1st of January as it is today. 
Um, this participant has submitted applications with the ASA for third country organization approval. Do you know when the ASA will make the TCO approval certificates available, please? I don't think we can speak on behalf of the ASA, but Steve, you might like to answer this one. The, the only thing I can say at the moment is that they've gone, it's all gone quiet because of the negotiations. So I think, I can't, I say, can't speak for the ASA, but I have a feeling that they're, they're, they're holding back at the moment until the negotiations are resolved one way or the other. But I would suggest uh, that as we get nearer, we, we may see some movement on that. Um, a question here also for you, Steve, I think. Are you intending to change the AMC to reflect the UKCAA Form 1 is acceptable dated post the 1st of January 2021? Again, this is an EASA decision and um, we've got no indication or we've got no sight that any change uh, will happen or is forthcoming. So I'm afraid I can't answer that one. And does the CAA intend to issue user guides relevant to the CAA approval as EASA currently does? At the moment, we do use the EASA user guides. Uh, they're a very useful uh, document. Um, it would make, I, I would believe we would at some point very soon be looking at issuing our own user guides. Yeah, I mean, I think it's clear that, you know, that, that information is good guidance, it's good information. So, uh, you know, but uh, the, the UKC is already looking at creating various different caps, and we have done so far. And, you know, any relevant information which is supporting what the uh, industry is doing today will be brought to course and we'll uh, publish it in our own domain. Right, there's a question here on the likelihood of an EU bilateral recognising the CAA Form 1. Just a reminder that those negotiations are ongoing, so we can't, um, unfortunately, we're not in a position to answer those questions uh, at the moment. Um, for a UK MRO to issue a dual release on an engine after December 31st, 2020, will the organisation have to issue a UK CAA Form 1 and new EASA Form 1 under the MRO's new foreign 145 certification? It will be two separate certificates. And will EASA approved AMOs be able to apply for a CAA Part 145 approval in a similar way uh, to UK based organisations can receive TCO approval? Yes, and that application process is already open. Uh, it's on the website. So what it doesn't, I mean, it's 145 camel uh, part, um, production. So uh, they can apply anytime they want. And it's a very similar process. Uh, a question here about bilaterals being published, specifically Brazil. Um, as mentioned earlier, the full list of bilaterals should be up by the end of next week. And there is a session on uh, a webinar session devoted uh, to this matter for production and maintenance organizations next Thursday. Um, will there be a third country approval for MOAs, MOAs outside the UK to be able to accept maintained parts for UK registered air? Uh, yes, there will be. Right, a few more questions in this marathon Q&A session. Just a reminder, anyone that we haven't answered will be following up uh, via email. If an EU operator requires a triple release, will we need to supply a CAA Form 1 triple release and an EASA Form 1 single release? As I said, the, the triple release won't happen because circumstances have changed slightly with our bilaterals, but the, you will have a CAA Form 1 with a relevant bilateral release on there and an EASA, separate EASA release with no other releases on there. And will EASA based 145, part 145 organizations be able to carry out base maintenance on UK registered aircraft? Currently under practice three, yes. But as I said, that is only for up to two years because then we don't have a cliff edge because obviously people's maintenance uh, plans are already in place. Uh, but uh, the UK CEA will be looking at getting base maintenance approved under UK approvals as soon as we possibly can once we understand what landscape we will be operating under in 2021. And going forward, MOAs with third country approvals may need a UK MOE and a NIASA MOE. Any thoughts on whether a combined document might be acceptable? Well, your UK approval will be, uh, obviously for those organisations in the UK, if, uh, it will be uh, UK. Whether EASA accepts a supplement to that is entirely up to themselves. Can a UK, a EU, sorry, can a 
EU approved part 145 based in the UK issue a CRS for UK registered aircraft line and base maintenance under a UK TC approval within the recognition period and after the recognition period. Yes, they can. Right, last few questions, Mark and Steve. Uh, does the statement in block 12 of EASA form one remain unchanged for third country C rated EASA part 145 AMOs after the end of the transition period? Yeah, that remains unchanged. The, the, the only change on the on the form one is the um, is, is basically the, uh, the top and bottom of the form. Yeah. Um, and do the deadlines for EU legislation like SMS in part 145 and the approval thereof, which are in the future, do these deadlines remain extant on the enactment of EU law into UK law, Steve? Now, once we get past um, the end of the year, uh, we are already looking at um, areas that are from ICAO SARPs that are missing from the EU regulation. So things like SMS uh, is already on our radar um, for uh, getting that uh, into uh, UK organisations. Great, thank you. And to round off our last question, which will be your hundredth question you've answered, um, Mark, will a current EU Part 66 license holder be required to pass any form of examination to hold a UK 66 license? Has the UK agreed to accept the EU license as a direct equivalent? So it's not a direct equivalent. Um, you know, it's something that we have managed, but uh, what we're intending, as I said, it's all about the records. Uh, and the, the situation is, is that if we get the right records, then nobody will have to do anything except apply. Great. Thank you both. Thank you both so much taking for so much taking so much time to both do, run through the presentation and do that Q&A session. As I said, there are still quite a few questions we didn't get to. I'm sorry that we didn't have time for that today, uh, but we will be able to follow up with you directly on email. We'll also be publishing this webinar on our YouTube channel and we'll link through to that from our dedicated microsite, as well as be emailing it to all uh, part 145 approval holders. So you'll have access to all the content that's been, um, uh, uh, that's taken place today. If you do have any, um, questions you will note from the invitation that we sent out for this webinar that the airworthiness team have uh, developed a dedicated inbox to answer any of those questions so do, do feel free to submit your questions to them there um, as well as go onto our microsite which is I'm sure you've all been to but is at info.caa.co.uk slash eu exit many thanks <laughs>